So um, I'll hand it over to Lori because I know the last time we did this session, we could have spent <laughs> three hours. There were so many questions, but we have about 40 minutes today. And we yeah. can always have Lori come back because it is such a fast. Everybody's top. Everybody loves space. So yeah. um, we are going to um, say hi to Lori, who's in Hawaii. And I think you can have some clues that she's in a little bit of a warmer space from her, um, from the <laughs> trees and the grass and the blue sky. So over to you, Lori. And these are the great students of Connected North at home. And just to remind you guys, um, we are monitoring the chat. And we're, you know, looking to make sure that you're on task. And if you have questions, I think we'll wait till we're maybe halfway through. Is that okay, Lori? And then we'll come back to you for questions. Okay, yeah. so we'll do our best to monitor the chat and um, so that Lori can answer questions in um, when it's time for questions. And, and she'll probably address the volcano. Do you want to talk about that right off the bat where you are and about the volcano? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Mally. So hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you guys today. Uh, as Mally said, I'm an astronomer, um, but uh, I'm originally from Canada. So I, I'm going to, I have a lot of different videos for you guys today. I'm going to talk about the solar system, the planets, but I try to focus on what I think is the more crazy uh, information, like the, the solar system is full of surprises and each planet is actually very different. And I don't think a lot of people realize that there are really different worlds. And when you start to study them and try to understand what's in each of the planets and how they form, uh, that's how you see how, cra how crazy it is, actually. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, here you go. And uh, I hope you guys can see it well. And um, there you go. Fantastic. OK. Um, so as Melanie mentioned, I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist. I work uh, at the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, so it's a telescope that is uh, partly Canadian, and uh, there's uh, about 10 Canadian that works with me there, but we're about 50 employees, uh, and uh, you have a lot of people from France, a lot of people from Hawaii, from the U.S., and um, I, uh, before I start, I want to say that I'm part of the First Nations from the Camille Noirs in Quebec, um, so for those who don't know Quebec very well, uh, so our uh, reserve is right here. Uh, my dad lives in another reserve nearby Quebec right here. And this is actually where we go hunting every year. And every year I go back to Canada in September for the moose hunt. And I take all my vacation just for that. Uh, I take three weeks and we go in our camp. This is our camp, the hunting camp uh, in the Ashat Mouchouan Reserve. And uh, it looks a little bit like that. We have a lake in front. and. Um, and here's two pictures of, uh, I, I saw in the chat earlier, there was someone talking about wolves, but yeah, we do have wolves in that area and they're pretty big. So this is a picture of my hand uh, by a wolf track. And also uh, I got lucky enough a couple of years ago to find an arrowhead in the lake. It was right on the shore and it was full of mud and kind of green that looked like a leaf. And I picked it up in my hand and I, I noticed it was a rock and I cleaned it up and uh, it's a beautiful arrowhead uh, that was right in the lake. And so anyway, uh, I, I, I started my journey there. I think I'm a scientist because I love nature. I love to understand how things work, uh, the weather, uh, the, the animals, the plants, everything. Um, but I think that once you start to look into the stars and you just uh, look ahead, up ahead, um, you can also study different things that are very, very interesting. And this is what led me into doing, doing a career uh, in astronomy. Um, I went to the university in physics. And uh, this is actually a picture of me right here uh, at the telescope of Montmagnacuc in Quebec when I was doing my training uh, as a master's student and after that a PhD student. And I was there with a, a couple of other students. And this is the telescope. And uh, it was obviously during the winter there. And um, I always tell people that everybody is kind of an astronomer. Uh, our ancestors were astronomers. And uh, I read a lot of things about how they were using the stars for different things. And one of my favorite stories is about a constellation that is a canoe. Uh, it's from the Ilnu uh, um, communities. Uh, so this constellation is actually a mix in between constellation that most people know today. So you have the big, uh, the, the, the big Dipper and, uh, um, and Orion. 
and uh, there are actually two animals that are um, that are paddling in a canoe. And uh, if you look at this constellation in uh, December, uh, it is kind of flat towards the horizon when uh, well when it's about seven o'clock when people go to bed. If you go outside and you look at, uh, into the sky, you would see a canoe that is perfectly horizontal towards the horizon. Um, and as you go into January, this constellation actually rotates. Um, and so if you would go outside in January, it would turn a little bit. And uh, they were using that to track when the days were going to start to become sh uh, longer. So to, to basically track the peak of the winter. And uh, it, they were actually as beautiful as they were explaining it like, okay, the canoe is turning. And if you're a paddler, you know that when you turn into the water, you're paddling and then you have to turn, you have to lose a lot of speed because it, you need to put your paddle in the water to turn the canoe. And as you turn, you lose speed. And I think it's beautiful because they were explaining how everything was like kind of a flow of a canoe into the sky. And once the canoe starts turning, it kind of slowed down and the days become longer. Anyway, so back then, everybody was an astronomer and we're using the stars um, to, to, to do a lot of things. And this is actually the, um, the North Star. If ever you don't know how to find it in the sky, you just have to find um, the Big Dipper. You find those two stars on the side, and it's about um, uh, four times the distance between those two stars in line, and you see a very bright star. It's the North Star. Everything rotates around it. So I finished my bachelor, my master, and my PhD. I become an astronomer uh, in 2017, and I get hired to work at the Canada French Hawaii Telescope. So after, like, I, I, I did my thesis defense at the university, and Literally uh, two weeks after that, I was on a plane to move to Hawaii. Uh, so it was really stressful, but uh, I did it. <laughs> My family helped me a lot. And this is where I was in Wendaki, and uh, this is where I went uh, in Kona, Kilua Kona, on the big island of Hawaii. And uh, this is the big island of Hawaii. Um, Hawaii is a, um, a theory of seven islands. Um, I'm on the biggest one uh, right here. It is also the island uh, known for uh, its volcanoes, uh, now and um, and uh, it actually has uh, three active volcanoes uh, that are not erupting right now, but they erupted uh, in 2018, uh, about a year ago. And uh, the one that we're uh, very interested in that is, uh, we can't see it very well, but it's right behind me, is the Mauna Kea, uh, right here. So the Mauna Kea has a uh, 13 telescope on it. Uh, one of which is uh, the one I work for. And on the south side of the island, you have the Mauna Loa, the Kiloea, um, you have Hualalai uh, that are kind of active. And on the north, you have a very old volcano that is called the Koala. Um, but this is where um, our telescope is. This is about where I am. And um, the office is where um, the telescope uh, is basically controlled, because we're controlling the telescope remotely. Is on the north side of the island, right there, which is quite far away from the active volcano. <laughs> and this is the, the telescope. So if you would be on the summit of the Monachia, which is at about uh, 4,250 meter height, uh, it's pretty high, uh, you would see our telescope uh, along with others. And uh, I like to show that picture because we can see that the, the clouds are actually below, most of the clouds. I have some stairs above, but most of the clouds are below, which is very convenient when you're trying to observe the stars. Uh, so we get really, really good uh, sky to observe and a lot of time to observe up there. And eruptions. So in 2018, I was here for about a year uh, back then. And I remember I was at the University of Hilo when I felt the first earthquake. Um, and um, it was pretty close from the volcano when I was at the university. And I got scared, <laughs> but uh, people here are used to it. There's a lot of earthquakes. Um, and sometimes you have eruptions. This one was a very bad one because it uh, destroyed a lot of houses, but um, the volcano here flow very smoothly. So nobody got hurt. Uh, everybody uh, had enough time to just run, uh, run away <laughs> from it. And believe it or not, you could still observe on the mountain while everything was happening, even if the volcano was erupting. And also sometimes we have hurricanes and things that hit the, the island. So this is a, one big hurricane that was coming toward, toward us. But um, when it happens, we have just to close the telescope. We are not observing for a couple of days to pass, and, and then we can continue. And this is the Monaco. 
Yeah, so if uh, we would be a little bit closer, uh, this is what you would see. Um, it's a winter um, on that picture, so there's a lot of snow on the summit. Yes, there can be snow in Hawaii. Uh, and you see all the little telescopes here. Um, this is the one I work for, the Canada Friends Hawaii Telescope right here. It's uh, in a very, very nice area of the summit. And, um, and if you would be inside the dome, this is what you would see. Um, this is a telescope and the slip. And I have a nice video that will show you how everything kind of moves around uh, into that building. So the whole building, uh, the dome can move, and uh, that's how you can point it in an air, any area of the guy. So, um, okay, now the slit is opening. Um, so when it's about sunset, uh, we're going to open the slit. And uh, if you are careful, you're going to see those little windows on the side. We are also going to open those windows. Uh, and we're going to let the air from the outside, the cold air from the outside, get into the building uh, around the telescope. And we want to make sure that everything around the telescope is really cold because uh, it helps for the observation. Um, it helps uh, for the air not to be turbulent, to make like really, really weird movements right above the telescope. And uh, this prevents us to, uh, from, from uh, having like really uh, twinkling stars if the air is moving a lot then the stars, uh, the stars start to twinkle, and uh, it's not good for, for observation. And now the cell phone is building, and I'm going to pause here. Yes, right here. And this, at the bottom of it, is a very big mirror of 3.6 meter. And this big mirror is actually what we use to gather the light from space and to observe it in a camera when we take pictures. Um, and to have a big mirror is really important because you gather a lot of light. And you can see very, very faint objects that you wouldn't uh, see with your eyes. So, and that's a video of a night on the Monarchia. It's a camera that we have put by the telescope. It shows all the clouds below and all the stars that are moving around the North Star. And the light here is actually light from a town nearby, from Hilo. And uh, so there's not a lot of light pollution there because most of the light remains below the clouds, so the clouds, the clouds can cover uh, the town and prevent the, the light to be to pollute the sky. You can see it now. And the sun is going to rise in a few seconds. Here you go. So that's uh, what it looks like. So today, we're traveling, we're going away from Earth. Uh, we're going to stay in the solar system, but I want to show this short video extracted from the movie Contact. Uh, just a short section uh, that shows the Earth, the Moon, and uh, we're moving away. We're going to see Mars um, and eventually the, the asteroid belt. Uh, and as we move further, we're going to see the gas, uh, plan the, the gas giant uh, planets like Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. And um, I think it's great because uh, it helps everybody to realize uh, that most of our universe is empty space. <laughs> and you have here and there a couple of little objects uh, that interact with each other. And, um, and just by studying what's inside the solar system, you already have a lot on your plate, uh, believe me. And um, if uh, we could continue a little bit further, we're going to see now a super belt of uh, asteroid, and eventually the very end of the solar system is the Oort cloud, um, which is a cloud full of comets. And we actually just barely saw it. And I'm going to go, go back onto the Oort cloud right here. There you go. Very faint. Um, so if you're careful, you're going to see it. It says bubble here. So that's where we're going to stay in today. <laughs> uh, we could go further and, uh, and see other stars in the Milky Way, the gas in the Milky Way, eventually come out of the Milky Way, which is our galaxy right there. Uh, which contains billions of stars uh, with a lot of gas. And also, we could eventually leave the Milky Way and see other galaxies around us, like this little dwarf galaxy. And maybe go around, um, this is Andromeda, the art of Andromeda galaxy, one of our neighbor, and see thousands and thousands and billions, actually, of galaxies around us. So today, we're really going to stay close <laughs> in a very small area around the Earth in the solar system. But uh, don't forget that there is a lot of things in space. And uh, in physics, in astrophysics, there are things uh, that we study that are called the fundamental forces. 
And I like to introduce that quickly because uh, I think uh, this is the most fascinating thing for me in, uh, in physics and in that science is that there are things that we can see around us that are controlling how the objects move and how things happen. And um, today we're going to focus on, the, uh, on gravity, on gravitational force. Um, th that is basically the force that, uh, that rules uh, the solar system. It, uh, it explains why the planets are revolving around the sun. Um, and also, uh, we're going to very slightly touch the electromagnetic force, which is also responsible for uh, solar eruption and, and uh, auroras. Um, but first, how does this work? How does the gravity force work? So it's something you can't see, and it's basically um, uh, why any mass attracts any other mass. And um, that's why we as, uh, as humans are stuck on the Earth, and uh, the, the Earth is actually pulling on us. And uh, if we want, we would like to go into space, we would have to build a shuttle that have a lot of power to get uh, rid of that uh, attraction and, and, uh, and, and, and be free in space. So. It's a force that depends on your mass. So if you're the sun, you're really, really massive, you're gonna attract objects like the Earth that is really far, but still your gravity for the gravity force that is generated by the sun is very strong. And the Earth is smaller, so there's a little bit of a pull from the sun towards the Earth, but it's much, much smaller. And the Earth, the Earth is actually moving fast in space. Um, just to give you an idea, right now we're moving in space at 40 uh, kilometers per second. So the Earth is like a big space shuttle, and uh, we don't feel it because there's the atmosphere on us and the, the, the space is empty, but we are actually moving at 40 kilometers per second, every second, so, so we're going fast. <laughs> and uh, that's why, uh, because of the force of gravity that pulls us towards the, the sun and our incredible speed, this is why we actually revolve around the sun. And that's the same for the moon. The moon is close to the Earth. It's attracted by the Earth. The Earth is also a little bit attracted uh, by the moon. And uh, the moon is going fast, and it's rotating around the Earth. Um, do you know, um, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to see the chat, but do you know one big effect of the pull uh, from the gravity of the moon on the Earth? It's something that we can observe uh, on the ocean, and especially if we are on the shore. Oh, the tide, Lucy said. Yes, exactly. The tide. So the, the moon is rotating around us. The Earth also rotates on itself. So when the, 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 something that we can very well see is the, the moon basically attracting the water from the ocean, pulling it up a little bit. And as everything rotates, it moves the water around the Earth. And you can see the water coming in and then coming out and coming in and coming out. This is just because of the gravity and uh, the force of gravity and uh, the fact that the moon is there. And of course, we're on the Earth. We're very close. We're very well attracted by it. Um, and if we were an astronaut on the moon, we would still be attracted by the moon. But the moon is smaller, so it would attract us a little bit less. Uh, and that's why when you look at videos of uh, astronauts walking on the moon, they look kind of funny because they, they, they look like they're jumping. Um, but it's just because the pull from the moon is less strong. Uh, than the pull from the Earth, if you were walking on the Earth. Okay, so just a couple of words. Uh, so the, the Earth rotates, we mentioned it. The reason why we have days and nights, uh, so we're rotating on ourselves every tw 24 hours every day. Um, so that's one very important motion of the planets. All the planets ro rotate on themselves. Um, then you have... Uh, Sometimes satellites like the moon, the Earth have uh, one big satellite like the moon, um, and we can see the effect of its rotation around us, especially when we look at the phases of the moon. Um, so the moon is uh, basically uh, highlighted by the sun on one side, and as it's rotating around us, uh, we can see different uh, phases of that movement. So I'm going to show you on that video. I'm going to go a little bit closer. This is the moon, and this is us, and the sun is up there. and um, as uh, the moon rotates, we see the, the sunlight coming here, just uh, um, highlighting one side of the moon, one side of the Earth, and there you go. And on that uh, right window here, you see the different phases of the moon as everything is, uh, is moving. Um, so 
when the moon is at the exact opposite right here, and we're going to see it, we're going to be at the full moon right there. So full moon is when the moon is right on the opposite side, and new moon would be all the way up to right in front where in the same direction of the sun, basically. So that, that movement is something that we can observe just by looking at, at the moon. And then we have the revolution of the Earth around the sun. Uh, and that's the reason why we have seasons. Um, and especially because we rotate on ourselves uh, every 24 hours. But it's tilted. You see that little axis is not perfectly right. It's a little bit uh, on the side. So because of that axis that is tilted and the fact that we rotate, we, it creates the seasons, uh, the winter and the summer. And all planets revolve around the sun. Uh, this is a small video that shows we see Mercury here, Venus, the Earth is the third one right there. And uh, one thing that is good to notice on that video is that if you're really close to the sun, you actually revolve uh, faster. So you would uh, go around the sun in less time than if you were uh, at the outskirts of the solar system, like a like uh, Venus, like um, Neptune or, or Uranus, for instance, that are really far away. And one of the nice things uh, that can happen also, and it's very, uh, very rare, sometimes you can observe solar eclipse. So the solar eclipse is when you have the moon right here, that would be in the new moon phase, but in a special one where it would actually coincide perfectly in the sky with the position of the sun. And when that happens, so you see the moon slowly moving and covering the sun completely, and and it looks like uh, it's night during the day. So the the sunlight is completely blocked, and it only lasts a few minutes. And uh, this is actually a really nice video where you see the ring of the light of the sun around uh, the moon, and it happens every I want to say 40 years, but it depends. And when you have a, a solar eclipse, it doesn't mean everybody on the Earth can't see it uh, full. So if you're not in the exact position, let's say in Mexico, people would see a full uh, solar eclipse. Whereas if you were in Canada, maybe you would see just a partial eclipse uh, or maybe not even an eclipse. It really depends on the angle uh, where you, you, you're looking at towards the sun. And um, so is a picture of the sun. Its surface. Uh, when you look at it closely, it is actually very interesting. It has those little cells, and it's actually boiling, kind of boiling matter. And um, some uh, the sun's surface is like liquid magma, but it's not the exact same thing. Uh, and sometimes you can also have eruption at the surface of the sun. It looks like this here, and this is caused by the electromagnetic force. So it's like the magnet force, the, the thing that pulls the magnets together or repel the magnets from each other. It also affects the surface of the sun, that weird kind of magma. And, and when you have eruption like that, it pulls a lot of small particles from the sun towards us sometimes. And this is a video that shows that. So you have an eruption, it pulls a lot of small particles towards us. And it takes a couple of days, like two or three days, and those particles can reach us. And the Earth is kind of protected by its own magnetic field, and those particles are attracted by it, and they go into the pole. I'm going to go back right here where we see when those particles hit. It's like a, a shield. Our magnetic field acts really like a shield, and those particles are attracted to the pole, the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. And when they reach the atmosphere and they collide with the atmosphere, this is what you see. And uh, so you, it, it creates those, those beautiful auroras that I hope you, uh, you're, you're able to see. I, I, I can't see them here in Hawaii because we're too far away from the poles. Um, but I remember when I was younger and when I would go uh, in some trips further north with my dad, we would, uh, we would be lucky enough to, to observe them. Okay, let's go back to uh, the solar system. Now this short video will show a little bit the size of the different objects that we're going to talk about uh, in the next few slides. And uh, I'm going to try to go so fast because I don't have a lot of time. And I think there's so many crazy things that we need to know about those planets. So this is Venus and the Earth. They're about the same size. 
And uh, I want to show, show it to you and I. I have a lot of videos, actually, from each of the planets. But I think it's neat to see how the Earth can be small compared to the gas giants. And how all the planets are actually very, very small if you compare them with the sun. So um, those planets were, were formed in space, just like the sun, with gas. Uh, if you remember that video I showed uh, earlier uh, of the Milky Way and the gas in the Milky Way, so the gas from the Milky Way can um, form new stars, can form new planets, and this is how the solar system was actually formed. And um, I'm going to uh, quickly go on a YouTube video that I uh, pulled out for you guys today. This is actually a simulation that shows a bunch of particles of gas that eventually create a disk and uh, in which uh, some of the, the planets can form. And here you see the stars, the stars in the middle, and the planets are actually those bubbles here. And when it's just a very, the very early time of the, the planetary system formation, um, you have a lot of collision. Some of the planets collide, they get destroyed, and the ones that really survive this very crazy part of that period are the ones that are the most stable. Well, there was almost a collision there. And, um, and I think there will be a collision yeah, right here. Boom. So this happens very often in, uh, in uh, planetary system formation. And we're going to go back to our presentation. Um, and I showed you that uh, because I, there will be a lot of videos showing that kind of things happening with our system. And, uh, oops, sorry. Yeah, okay. Go back here. So um, here are our planets. Uh, you see the asteroid belt here also, and the Cupid belt here, and the Oort cloud. Um, as I was mentioning, they each revolve around the sun at very different uh, speeds. So uh, Mercury, for instance, rotates around the sun in 87 days. Whereas if we compare the extreme, Neptune takes 165 years to go around the sun just once. And also there's a lot of difference in temperature. So Mercury, for instance, go, go all the way up to 425 degrees and Venus even more, whereas Neptune is about minus 200 degrees. <laughs> so it's very, very cold if you're out in the outskirts of the solar system. So let's start with Mer Mercury. So I have a, uh, this is what Mercury looked like. Um, and this is a video that shows why it looks like that. So at the very early uh, beginning of the solar system, there was a lot of asteroids colliding with planets in the sun. And Mercury was actually a very good target because it was really close to the sun. Everything is attracted by the sun. So there was so many asteroids bombarding the surface of Mercury that it looks like that today. And uh, it actually has one of the biggest asteroid impacts of the solar system. It's the one on Mercury, it's this one, the biggest asteroid collision. And, um, and you can see a lot of these craters and like sometimes you have cracks and things like that. And uh, if you're lucky, sometimes you can observe Mercury passing in front of the sun like this. Now Venus. Um, Venus, what is crazy about Venus, it's its, temp it's, its temperature, but also its atmosphere. Uh, this is a really thick atmosphere. There's a lot of gas, sulfuric acid on the, 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 in the atmosphere of Venus. And if you remove it, when you look at the surface, we see, we see it's very different. There's a lot of rivers and structures, but it's, there's no water. It's just, uh, it's just rocky, rocky surface. And the reason for that is uh, also related to the same reason that why we have aur auroras. So Venus is close to the sun, and um, the sun is launching those very high energy particles sometimes towards planets, and it kind of blow away the nice gas that you would have in, uh, in the atmosphere like we have on Earth. And uh, the gas that only remains are the heavy um, sulfuric acid gas and very, um, very intense one that keeps the heat on the surface of the planet. Um, it's like a, a, a green effect on, on the surface of the planet. And it has a super atmosphere with extreme winds of 360 kilometers per second, it has super um, uh, hurricanes at its pole. This is a, a, a picture of it, and this is what it would look like. Uh, and it's permanently there. There's like those storms uh, the, uh, on the surface of Venus. And there's also a lot of lightning. 
There's an old volcano that you can see through those images. And uh, they are not quite active right now, but you can see that they were active in the past. And you can also see Venus passing in front of the sun when uh, there's a, uh, a Venus um, uh, eclipse. Now let's go on Earth. So now the Earth is very interesting. It's our own planet. It has volcanoes, uh, good atmosphere, it has water, liquid water, life, a lot of a very interesting things, a magnetic field that protects us from the particles of the sun. But the Earth has a very interesting story. So uh, researchers know now that in the past, there was another object that they called Kea uh, that was a big planet um, that actually collided with, uh, with the Earth. Um, and so Kea came by uh, and the collision was so energetic and strong that it kind of uh, blew a lot of matter everywhere in space, uh, a lot of rocks that got blown away. And um, those rocks that got blown away very, very far were actually a little bit lighter um, than the rest of the matter that was forming the Earth. And those light, very light rocks uh, with the force of gravity again recombined and formed right here, they formed the moon, which is actually very light compared to the Earth, which is heavier. And we know that because of the composition of the moon, when you look at the moon and you study its composition, it only makes sense if there was that collision that propulsed all the light rocks away and reformed the moon. There you go. And this is actually the surface of the moon and all the different colors uh, can be uh, related to its uh, chemical composition here. Uh, so we know that there's a, a lot of uh, different things on the moon than on the Earth. And on my favorite one, I'm so glad I made it to Mars. So Mars, uh, it's my favorite planet. Um, it has temperature a little bit colder than the Earth, two moons, but mostly volcanoes. Uh, and they're not active right now, but they could be. Uh, and some of the robots that are actually on the surface of Mars detect earthquakes once in a while, and there's still activity under the surface. And Mars is smaller than the Earth, okay? But what is crazy about it is that if you look at its world map, so this is the world map of, of um, Mars, there is this area here, which has the biggest volcano of the whole solar system. And it's called Mount Olympus, and it's right there. So Mount Olympus is the biggest volcano of the solar system. It is 25 kilometer high, so it's three times Mount Everest. It's crazy. It's tip, at the tip of the volcano is actually not into the atmosphere of Mars. It's like in space. Like there is no atmosphere at the tip of that volcano. Uh, it's that high. And right beside it, there's also a crater, uh, not a crater, but um, a canyon that is 16 kilometers deep. So aside from that, the, um, uh, the Grand Canyon in the US is only two kilometers deep. It's like eight times the Grand Canyon. And they're close from each other, it's crazy. And one of its sides is actually flat and the people think that there was an ocean on Mars and the ocean was actually covering that flat area over there. And um, okay, so Mars is different a little bit from the Earth. Um, one of the reasons that researchers uh, think Mars is so different and why actually it has lost its ocean of water is also because of those sun particles that I'm talking all over uh, for, to explain the auras and to explain also the atmosphere of Venus. So those sun particles, when they get um, to, um, to Mars, um, well, uh, they kind of hit Mars very, very uh, hard because Mars doesn't have a magnetic field that acts like this shield like on Earth. And so those particles kind of rip the particle of the atmosphere away from Mars. And there was probably a lot of water in the atmosphere uh, and slowly those particles of water got, um, got pushed away by, by the sun particles. And this is what my, Mars might have looked like in the past. So you see big ocean on one side and then the other side with uh, volcanoes and things like that. And this was about 4 billion years ago. So a long, long time ago, Mars might have had water. And still so today we can see some traces of water. This is some pictures from the robot on Mars. And Mars can be stormy. This is two pictures of Mars. This is June 2001. This is September 2001. And in September, there was a major uh, um, 
windstorm and uh, it blew a lot of dust into the air and Mars got covered by it. And this is a, a, a wind uh, tornado uh, uh, captured by one of the, the robots actually. And these are real color images from the surface of Mars. So if you were there, uh, this is what a, a sunset on Mars would look like. Now, uh, Jupiter. I only have a few minutes left to go through the, the gas giants, uh, but they're really interesting too. So this is the biggest planet of the solar system. It rotates on itself every 10 hours. So it rotates very, very fast. And uh, it also has a very strong magnetic field, partially because of that. So this is a picture of uh, a, one of the, the satellites that um, uh, was getting towards Jupiter. And you see it's very, very high velocity rotation and all the gas in the storm. Uh, uh, this is actually a storm that is on Jupiter all the time. It never dies. And um, if we take a closer look, we can see those, those clouds and it has different compositions. It's mainly ammoniac, uh, water, ice, and things like that. And you can see sometimes some lightning. And auroras, magnetic field means a little bit of uh, auroras activity. So you can also observe auroras on the pole of Jupiter. And this is a very nice picture of them. And you see those spots right there? There are actually connections between the magnetic field of the planet and its moons. So some of the moons are not too far away, and they kind of create those, those bright spots in the auroras. And that's a video of it right there. And uh, Jupiter has very thin rings. And also, it is followed on its orbit around the sun by a bunch of asteroids. And sometimes they collide with uh, Jupiter, and we can see the big explosion on its surface. And these are a couple of images of the moons of Jupiter. They are very different, different surfaces. Some have volcanoes, some have icy surfaces and cracks. And um, some of them are really interesting, because when they rotate around the planet, they rotate in a very weird oval shape like that. And it actually creates really weird tides. So uh, we, we don't have liquid water, but it's ice. And the tide basically is just because the, the ice is moving like that instead of the water being pulling, pulling like it is uh, for us uh, with the moon. And this actually creates friction. And this friction creates heat. And it could uh, allow or uh, enable liquid water to exist under the surface of that moon. And people think that there even might be life under the ice of some of the moon of Jupiter because of that uh, effect. This is a picture of Jupiter with four of the main moons that we can see with a small telescope. Now Saturn, big rings, some storms sometimes right there. And, um, and this is a couple of images of the storms that can build up on the surface of Saturn. Uh, there's a bunch of hurricanes always, it's gas giants, so there's no real surface on, uh, on those planets. And there's a mysterious shape that is called the hexagon uh, on the North Pole. Uh, this is an actual footage of the hexagon. Uh, it's always there. And it, people thought actually at the beginning that it could be like alien or something that would create an hexagon on the surface of Saturn, but uh, scientists were able actually to replicate what's happening in the atmosphere of Saturn. And they did it in a lab in different ways. And they were able to recreate hexagonal shape uh, with different liquids and different gas. And here you see it. So it's not aliens, unfortunately. It's just a, a natural phenomenon. And uh, the rings of Saturn are composed of ice. Uh, they are big blocks of ice that can be as big as a house. And each of them have different, um, they are, um, more or less clean water. So some of them have some dust in them, and that's why they have different colors. Um, so they can be dusty rings or clean water rings, just like we see here. And um, so Saturn has two very interesting moons, Titan, which has uh, a surface that looks like the Earth, but not the same chemical composition. And people think that the Earth at, in the early uh, years of the solar system might have looked like Titan. So it's like a copy of the Earth back 4 billion years ago, maybe. And there's Enceladus that has cracks of water, and it actually has geysers. 
So sometimes the, the water comes out of those cracks. And uh, Ancelade, um, we have pictures here that shows actually the water coming out of the cracks. And actually, Ancelade goes around Saturn and creates its own ring. We see Ancelade here, and there's a fuzzy ring of water that is there just because of that, those geysers. This is a picture of Saturn. Um, Uranus is special because its rotation is completely different than all of the other planets. So you see here, all the planets kind of rotate on themselves like that or like that. Well, Uranus is literally rolling on its orbit. And because of that, there's one side showing, uh, uh, one, one face uh, being like uh, illuminated by the sun and one face being in the dark all the time. And um, there's also rings uh, in Uranus, and we know it because you see that little, uh, that little moon there. I'm going to start the video again. So that little moon passed behind um, the, the, the rings, and we see those dark flashing um, moments, and it's how we basically detected for the first time those rings. Uh, we didn't know that Uranus had rings, and we saw that, that, that moon passing behind it. And uh, we know now that there is a couple of rings around Uranus, and they are looking like that. And the latest satellite, Uranus, and, and finally Neptune. Neptune is special for its winds. We're talking about winds of about 2,000 kilometers per hour. It's very, very fast. And how we know that is that sometimes there are really, really shallow clouds that forms on the surface of it. And we can see them rotating around the planet. And that's how we calculated their speed. And we found out that they were going at 2,000 kilometers per hour. Here they go. That's crazy. So it's the fastest wind you can find on planets in the solar system. It has a very interesting moon called Triton that if you look also very closely, you'll see geysers coming out of the surface those geysers push out a lot of dust, and um, it actually look a little weird. Like you can see the, the those black, dark spot on the surface of Triton, and you know because of those liney kind of deposit of dust that there's wind on Triton because only wind could push the gas from the geysers to go in all the same direction. And so we never measured it, but we see that uh, deposit of dust uh, around the geysers, and we know for that reason that there's wind on Triton, on one of the moon of Neptune. So this is how you do science when the, it is that far, when you can't go. You're trying to look and find clues on how things work. And this is a picture of uh, Uranus, the picture of Neptune, because they're really far away. We, we only see blue dots like that. There's a bunch of other objects that are not considered this planet in the solar system, Pluton, uh, make me uh, Haumea and others, and um, just a couple of uh, an image showing their orbits. Uh, those orbits are slightly different orbits for planets. That's why they are not considered as planets. Um, and if you look beyond the solar system, then you can see uh, you can find exoplanets that are revolving around other stars that are not the sun. And this is just an image of a couple of them. But we only start to discover those planets. And uh, those images are not real images, it's just the way we think they might look like. Um, and eventually with a bigger telescope, but more people studying them, we'll have a better idea of what they actually look like. And um, uh, I'm going to end up there, and I hope you have questions and that you appreciate the, the talk. Thank you. That was fabulous, Lori. And we only have a couple minutes for questions because we uh, sadly booked back to back. That was so amazing, and um, I think Katie and I were chatting, and we'd love to have you come back and talk a little bit more. Um, the kids were yeah. silent in the chat, which meant they were really engaged in it. So does anyone have one or two questions? I know there was one back here about Pluto being um, uh, relegated yeah. down yeah. from a planet. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a planet anymore. Uh, it's, it's, you know, all the planets are kind of rotating around the sun in a disk because they were formed out of the same gas at the beginning, you know, that simulation I showed from YouTube. But Pluto is actually rotating in a different uh, path. So it's not in the disk. It's like going out of the disk, coming in. 
And because of that, they think that it's just an object that was basically captured by the solar system gravity, but that was not formed with the other planets. And so if it's not formed in the disk, it's not a planet. Uh, and that's the reason why Pluto got, uh, uh, got out of the, 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 the gang, but uh, it's still a big object and it's revolving uh, in an orbit a little bit further than Neptune. Awesome. And Gabriella said the big chart with so many planets was interesting. Does anyone have another yeah. one last question before we go over to yoga? <laughs> Mally, I was wondering, and Evan was wondering about life on other planets. Is there, have you, have they found signs of life? The I have found clear signs of life because to be able to, to, to see that we would need better observation and we don't have big telescope big enough yet to do that. But they have plans to build telescope that will be able to see that. Um, although they can tell if there's liquid water and it's one of the ingredients that you need for life. So they can tell if one of those planets is at the right distance from a star and it has, if it has the same, the right mass, the right size. And, and there's a lot of those planets that are actually in the, um, the, the zone where life would be possible. Wow, that's fascinating. And as we can hear, you come back um, again, and we'll send you an email. But thanks, students, for um, oh, oh uh, Tristan wants to know about black holes, but that's going to be the next session because that's Lori's passion. If we start talking about black holes, Lori will be here. Uh, like, yeah, we'll talk. We'll about be in a black hole, right, Lori? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tristan, come back next time you. Um, you see Lori's name on the program because she will will we'll get her talking about black holes and it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah oh, they have these yeah. minutes of free time, so I would have more time to talk about them. So one till five, and that's the day. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, Lori, and enjoy your beautiful day in Hawaii. We could hear the birds singing, and yeah. all the students are thank, you, thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Good. Thanks so much. Have a great night. Okay. Yeah.